Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the bank's financial stability report press conference. On my left is Sam Woods, the Deputy Governor for Prudential Regulation. On my far right is Ben Broadbent, the Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy. Next to Ben is John Cunliffe, the Deputy Governor for Financial Stability. And on my immediate right is the Governor, Mark Carney. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The Bank of England's job is to promote um, the good of the people of the United Kingdom by maintaining monetary and financial stability. That means low, stable, and predictable inflation, and it means resilient and reliable financial system that's there for UK households and businesses in good times as well as bad. The bank focuses on the necessities of price and financial stability so that people can focus on what matters most to them, such as buying a house, saving for education or retirement, or starting a business. And the single most important determinant at present of the UK economic outlook is the nature and timing of Brexit. Since the referendum, the bank has done everything we can to ensure we're ready for Brexit, whatever form it takes. As today's stress tests reveal, the core of our financial system is strong. Major banks have capital ratios three and a half times higher than before the financial crisis. We've worked closely with the UK government, other UK authorities, and European partners to manage possible risks of disruption to the financial system. And most fundamentally, our institutional framework is robust. The bank has clear objectives, operational independence, all the necessary tools, and the resolve to deliver our monetary and financial stability remits. So consistent with those remits, the bank is publishing two documents today. The first is our latest financial stability report, which details the important current risks to UK financial stability, and they run beyond Brexit. Um, but it also includes our latest stress tests of major UK banks. And secondly, our response to the House of Commons Treasury Committee's request for analysis of how Brexit will affect the bank's ability to deliver our, our objectives. Specifically, the TSC requested that the bank focus on the consequences of a potential economic partnership with the EU and a no-deal, no-transition Brexit scenario. And let me begin by stressing what these analyses are and what they are not. These are scenarios, not forecasts. They illustrate what could happen, not necessarily what's most likely to happen. Building scenarios requires making assumptions about the form of the new relationship between the UK and the EU, the degree of preparedness across firms and critical infrastructure, and the response of macroeconomic policies. The scenarios are calculated for the policy-relevant timelines for the bank, that is, up to five years, and as such, they're not assessments of the relative long-term merits of different trading relationships. The, scenari the scenarios are, however, informative about the relative economic impacts of various economic relationships and the transitions to them. Taken together, the scenarios highlight that the impact of Brexit will depend on the direction, magnitude, and speed of the effect of reduced openness on the, EU on the UK economy. The direction of the effects of a reduction in openness is clear. Lower supply capacity, weaker demand, a lower exchange rate, and higher inflation. The magnitude of these economic impacts is modeled using established empirical relationships, and it's disciplined by the bank's suite of macroeconomic models to ensure their coherence and plausibility. But the speed of adjustment is less clear, given the lack of precedence of reduced openness, particularly amongst advanced economies. So the worst case scenarios assume that adjustment to deintegration happens more rapidly than it has over the past decades to integration. This assumption is grounded by cross-checks, including econometric models, case studies, and intelligence from the bank's agents across the United Kingdom. The MPC and the FPC have reviewed the relevant scenarios, and they will use them as inputs in their policy deliberations. So let me turn to a few key observations, starting with the economic partnership. These scenarios reflect government policy and are most relevant for the MPC. They show the sensitivities to key elements of the new partnership yet to be negotiated, such as the extent of customs and regulatory checks, the degree of non-tariff barriers to services trade, and the breadth of equivalence determinations for financial services. In the five years under the partnership scenarios, GDP is between one and a quarter percent 
and three and three quarters percent lower than it would have been if the economy had continued growing at its May 2016 trend rate. Relative to the bank's most recent forecast in November, inflation is lower in the near term in both scenarios given the appreciation in sterling. It rises as the transition period ends due to the fading effects of that appreciation and in the less close partnership scenario as custom barriers take effect from 2021. A mechanical model of monetary policy generates a gently rising path for bank rate over the scenario. This should not be taken as a prediction of the actual path for bank rates, which will depend in practice on the balance of effects of demand, supply and the exchange rate. Turning to no deal and no transition Brexit, there are a range of possible outcomes in the event of that, consistent but consistent with the FPC's remit, a remit to protect and enhance the resilient resilience of the UK financial system to major shocks, the FPC has focused on two variants labeled disruptive and disorderly, which are underpinned by worst case, worst case assumptions. In both scenarios, tariffs and other trade barriers are introduced suddenly next spring. The UK recognizes EU product standards, but the EU does not reciprocate. In the more severe or disorderly scenario, the UK's border infrastructure does not cope smoothly with new customs requirements for some time. There is a pronounced increase in the return investors' demand for holding sterling assets. By the end of 2023, GDP is more than 10 percent lower in the disorderly scenario compared to that May 2016 trend. Despite this sharp contraction in GDP, something that's bigger than the, happened during the financial crisis, unemployment rises to 7.5 percent less than during the financial crisis and that reflects the supply-driven nature of the downturn. The sharp fall in sterling, alongside with the imposition of tariffs, pushes up the cost of imports and overall CPI inflation peaks at 6.6 percent. In line with its remit, the MPC does what's necessary to achieve its inflation target, with bank rate rising sharply to 5.5 percent in the disorderly scenario, although again I'll remind you that that is a mechanical calculation. The FPC has assessed the resilience of the financial system to these worst-case outcomes, and its key findings are, first, based on comparison with the 2018 stress tests that were released today, the FPC judges that the UK banking system is strong enough to continue to serve UK households and businesses even in the event of a disorderly Brexit. So even after that unlikely event, we calculate the major UK banks will still have capital ratios around three times higher than they had before the financial crisis. And I'd ask you to recall that the bank stress test released today is two and a half times more severe than the Brexit scenario, worst case Brexit scenario I just described. That is what being prepared for all eventualities requires. Secondly, Major UK banks have ample liquidity to withstand a major market disruption. They hold more than one trillion pounds of high-quality high liquid assets and can access an additional 300 billion pounds of liquidity through the Bank of England's regular facilities. Major UK banks can now withstand many months without access to wholesale or foreign exchange markets. And thirdly, the FPC has worked with other authorities to ensure most risks of disruption to cross-border financial services have been addressed. And in this regard, two main actions remain. Further UK legislation, currently in train, will need to be passed for a fully and, fully and functioning legal and regulatory framework for financial services to be in place ahead of Brexit. And the European Commission needs to provide uh, greater clarity to reduce disruption risks in derivative markets following their recent and welcome statements. Finally, the Bank of England, with other authorities, has put extensive contingency plans in place to support institutional resilience and market functioning during any period of heightened uncertainty, as we did around the 2016 referendum. We're closely monitoring market developments. We can lend in all major currencies, and if required, 
the FPC stands ready to cut the countercyclical capital buffer if economic stresses were to materialize. Now, the bank's ability to achieve its monetary and financial stability objectives also depends on, a on both the transition and the end state. The level of preparedness of businesses and infrastructure, infrastructure such as ports, custom systems, and transportation operations, will be important determinants of how well the economy adjusts to new trade barriers. Evidence from surveys and other UK authorities suggests that the country is not yet fully prepared for a cliff-edge Brexit. Surveys suggest that less than half of businesses have initiated contingency plans for no deal, and less than a fifth of small businesses have done so. Up to a quarter of a million traders have never completed a customs declaration. 11 of 12 major projects to replace key border systems are at risk of not being delivered by March 29, 2019. Securing an implementation period will minimize the impacts on the UK economy. And a sober objective assessment of the appropriate length of that implementation period is desirable to get Brexit off to the right start. This implementation period should be as long as necessary to prepare properly for new trading relationships, but no longer. Turning to the end state, as you know, the UK is home to the world's leading international financial centre. At around 10 times GDP by asset size, the scale of activity of the UK financial system and its complexity is unmatched in other jurisdictions. This confers a special responsibility on the bank to ensure that that system is robust to a wide range of potential domestic and global shocks. That's why, irrespective of the particular form of the UK's future relationship with the EU and consistent with its statutory responsibility, the Bank of England will remain committed to the implementation of robust prudential standards in the UK. This will require maintaining a level of resilience that's at least as great as currently planned, which itself exceeds that required by international baseline standards. It will also require maintaining more generally the UK authority's ability to manage UK financial stability risks. So to conclude, the Bank of England is ready for Brexit, whatever form it takes. The analysis released today confirms that the core of the UK financial system is resilient to worst-case Brexit scenarios. We have contingency plans in place to support market functioning if necessary. But to be clear, the bank being ready for Brexit is not sufficient to guarantee a particular economic outcome. There's little monetary policy can do to offset the potentially significant hits to productivity and supply that Brexit could entail. Our unwavering commitments to price and financial stability will support the necessary adjustment of that real economy. But the future potential of this economy and its implications for jobs, real wages and wealth are not in the gift of central bankers. Rather, the economic consequences of Brexit over the longer term will depend on the nature of the UK's future trading relationship, on other government policies, and ultimately on the ingenuity and enterprise of the British people. And with that, uh, my colleagues and I would be pleased to take